The work I'm sharing with you is on decision making at the Jamaican IDT, the Industrial Disputes Tribunal, and it looks at the decision making that takes place there, in particular in the area of dismissal disputes and disciplinary disputes that have been presented there for most of the life of the IDT. Basically, give an introduction, the context of the work, and in particular, the context of the IDT. Um, a little look at the literature, the methodology I used. But I would really want to spend most of my time this afternoon looking at my preliminary findings, as well as briefly mentioning the preliminary recommendations. Um, it is a work in progress, and so the findings that I'm sharing with you this afternoon are preliminary. I hope to find more things as I delve into the data and get a better understanding of it. And so straight into the background, the IDT was established in about 1995 under the Labor Relations and Industrial Disputes Act, that important piece of legislation that was enacted in the 70s that established a mechanism for the industrial harmony and peace. And so it serves as the third tier of the disputes resolution mechanism. The first tier is supposed to be negotiations at the local level. And then if that fails, you have conciliation by the Ministry of Labor. And then the Industrial Disputes Tribunal is to be the third tier where the dispute is now presented to arbitrators and they make a binding decision on the disputed matter. As we know, however, and most of you know, it often doesn't stop there. And sometimes the awards of the IDT are challenged in the court system and it can go all the way up to the Privy Council. But those challenges would be primarily on points of law and not on the substance of the award per se. Um, the IDT plays this critical role in achieving and maintaining industrial peace in Jamaica. And so the rationale for the study is that the IDT has been around playing this important role, but it hasn't been thoroughly examined for the over, well, close to 40 years of its history and its existence. Um, and importantly, I think we need to have an understanding of the decision-making process and some of the factors that influence the decision-making of this important institution. So the purpose of the study is to not only identify but also to perhaps quantify those factors that influence the decisions made by the IDT in its dismissal and discipline disputes. And so for those of you who are familiar with the IDT, you know that a number of disputes go there but we can put them into different categories. And so you have disputes over wages and working conditions, which you could consider disputes of interest. You have disputes over discipline and dismissals, which could be considered disputes of rights. And then you also have this smaller third category, which are your disputes over bargaining rights, which form a special category. And it's a special role that the IDT plays in terms of helping to determine and make smooth that process of establishing bargaining rights in, or unions as getting their bargaining rights in organizations. So the focus of my study is on those dismissal and discipline disputes. And in fact, most of the disputes were actually dismissal disputes. There were very few discipline disputes, and so most of the attention is really on the dismissal side. The key research questions, what is influencing the decisions, um, and in particular, are these decisions influenced by the people involved in the process? Um, the grievant, who is appearing before the IDT, as well as, is it being influenced by who the arbitrators are and their backgrounds. And then also I um, looked at to what extent 
were the decisions influenced by characteristics of the process involved. And in particular, I focused on the whole issue of legalism, where looking at it primarily from the perspective of the involvement of lawyers representing grievance, as well as whether the arbitrators were lawyers and had legal backgrounds. And I also looked at the whole issue of time. Um, the length of time it was taken to settle those disputes, the time that the, 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 the IDT took to hear the matter and present a decision, and how time and the length of time it took impacted on their decision making. Um, the basic conceptual model that I have is where you have the IDT decisions, and it can be influenced by two sets of things facts that relate to the case, and that is the ideal, where they just consider what is important, and they use that to make the decision. And then you have no factors that are outside of the case, extraneous matters that sometimes influence people's decision making. And so the idea is to try and get an understanding of what factors outside of the case have the, in, an impact on the IDT's decisions. And I will talk a bit more about the model and some of the attributes of the model as we go through the presentation. Um, the significance of the study, it is the first in-depth study, empirical study of the IDT and its operations, covering a large portion of its history. Um, the parties who present themselves and represent people at the IDT and grievance and employers, they need to know and understand how the decisions of the IDT are made so that they both, both on both sides, interestingly, can improve their success rate at the IDT. Um, it's also important for policymakers to understand um, how these decisions are made and to be sure that they are free from any kind of bias and to make sure that it not only is free, but it also appears to be free. Because there is this important thing about justice that um, it's the appearance sometimes of the injustice that is also important, and not just the final decisions themselves. And importantly, it fills a critical gap in the literature. There is no, like I said, real literature on empirical research being done on many of these areas, important areas in the Caribbean, and in particular also in Jamaica. And so this helps to fill that gap. In terms of the context, the IDT is a little different from a lot of the arbitration that takes place in other jurisdictions around the world. In particular, the IDT is a creature of the statute. I mentioned the Labor Relations and Industrial Disputes Act. The arbitration service is interestingly provided free by the government of Jamaica. You do not pay um, the, the grievant, nor the company pays the arbitrator. And this is something that is unique in the Jamaican environment even though we often hear about um, budget constraints and things like that. In other jurisdictions, if you want arbitration, the parties split the bill to pay for the arbitrator. In Jamaica, from, from inception, um, the government has covered that cost and provided an elaborate you know, um, support structure with um, stenotypist secretaries, um, legal um, experts um, to support the arbitrators and their decision makers. What is also unique about the Jamaican IDT and distinguishes it from many, a lot of the arbitration that takes place in the USA and Canada is the fact that we use these um, three member panels to hear the disputes and to make decisions, and the panel has a chairman, and it also has two reps, one who is assigned as an employer rep, 
and the other one who is assigned as a worker rep. And although they have these titles, they are all three are expected to be independent and to give balance judgments. And what is the decision is the outcome of the majority of the members. In terms of the literature, there are a number of streams in the literature that look at things that focus on the principles behind some of the decision making. Um, the people, whether it is the arbitrator, the grievance and their attributes, as well as the processes um, and focusing on things like the extent of legal representation and the time issues have also been given some amount of attention in the literature. From a methodological perspective, you have again two main streams. You have studies, the empirical studies that have been based on experiments and those that have been based on field studies. The experiments sometimes use students as subjects, sometimes they use practicing arbitrators, or some and very often what they do is they present these groups with hypothetical cases. Um, and then you have the field studies that actually focus on the published um, arbitration awards. And in terms of geographic coverage, a lot of the work or a lot of the literature focuses on jurisdictions in the United States, Canada, UK. And there is a little bit of Jamaican literature as well. And so just to mention some of the Jamaican literature, you have the classics like the work by George Eaton, um, Gershenfield, as well as some seminal contemporary works by our own Noel Cowell, Dr. Noel Cowell, as well as our own Dr. Orville Taylor. And there are as well some empirical studies, primarily descriptive empirical studies that have been put out by the JTURDC and that have also been done by students at the University College of the Caribbean. In terms of the methodology, um, my study was a field study, so I went into the IDT and I looked at the IDT awards um, for the, that entire period, 1975 to 2012. I focused primarily on the dismissal awards. Um, in all, for that 37 or 30 odd year period, over 1,000 awards have been handed down but approximately 400 of those awards were dismissal and disciplinary awards. And so that was basically the population. And I used the entire listing of the 400 awards as a sample frame, and I drew a random sample from that of 140 awards. Um, in terms of data collection, it involved us going into the IDT, accessing the awards, doing a content analysis. So I led a small team of persons, including an assistant who I, I recruited my son, who is here <laughs> supporting me, as well as another assistant. And we spent about a month last year this time at the IDT, digging through dusty files and trying to get as much data as we could out of the process. We coded it, we entered it in SPSS, and we did some initial analysis. Um, the type of analysis we want to do is logistic regression, and I have done a round or two of that, and I still have more to do in that area. In terms of the preliminary, preliminary findings, um, there is basically an even split. So in terms of understanding the IDT decision, somebody and the decisions in terms of dismissal disputes, um, somebody would have been dismissed from an organization and they would have felt that they were wrongly dismissed. They are the grievant and they would have registered that grievance and it would have reached now the third tier, the IDT and the IDT now decides, was that dismissal justified or unjustified? If it is justified, they're basically saying that the management was correct in its action. Um, if it is unjustified, they're basically saying that the management was wrong and the, you, the worker 
should either be compensated or given back their job or some corrective action be taken if necessary. And so what we're seeing there is that you have this half and half split, um, which is fairly good. Um, looking again back at the model and just pointing out that these now are the factors outside of the case that I focused on, gender, legalism, and time, and especially for this presentation, that's where the focus is. Um, and I've also added this one of the grievant representation and looking at the success rates of these representatives of these grievants. So the first area is gender, and it's important to note that there is no female chairman or deputy chairman, and so you have a chairman of the entire IDT, and then you have other panels, um, and you have the deputy chairman sitting on these panels, and so there's no female in either role for the 30 odd years of the history of the IDT, and I see my <laughs> shaking, the ladies are shaking their head, and so the 51% um, movement needs to perhaps latch on to the IDT and, and advocate for change in that area. It's also interesting to note, sorry, let me back up, that there are very, very few female workers, worker and employer reps at the IDT. I think for the sample that I drew of 140 awards, only twice or three times were women there. I think there was one female employer rep and one worker, one female worker rep. I think the female employer rep was um, Avis Henriquez, who was um, recently deceased. Um, most of the grievance, though, are male as well. And so when we look at the gender breakdown, we see the males dominating and the females um, taken up a smaller proportion in terms of the grievance. Um, however, it's interesting in terms of the success rates by gender. The women were much more successful than the men. And so the IDT, this would suggest, um, has a little soft spot for the female grievance. And the literature supports this kind of thing where when women go before judges, um, especially male judges, they tend to be more sympathetic and soft on them. Um, is that a good thing? For the women, yes, but then for the men, no, because they tend to sometimes to be harder on the men. Um, and so the justice system is filled with um, you know, examples of men being marginalized and being treated in a, you know, given a hard time in the justice system. In terms of legalism, you, this is where we're looking at, again, lawyers representing the grievance, as well as lawyers acting as arbitrators or arbitrators being skilled in the area of law. Um, in terms of using lawyers, employers used lawyers much more than the grievance. And in most cases, the grievance were represented by a trade union. They were members of a trade union and they were represented by the trade union officer. There were rare cases where some trade unions would hire lawyers to support their team. And there were also some cases where the grievance were not members of a trade union and they would therefore hire their own lawyer. Uh, but it was really in a limited number of cases. In terms of the success rates on the lawyer side, we're seeing that in terms of the success rates, when the employer used a lawyer, and when they used, did not use a lawyer, the rates were basically the same. But I'm sure the costs would not have been. These lawyers are sometimes very expensive. In terms of the grievance success rates, again, they're similar in terms of when they don't use a lawyer and when they use a lawyer. You're seeing a small difference, but it's not major. Um, in most cases, the chairman was not a lawyer. The chairman had no legal expertise. Yes, they would have 
legal support and there's a legal officer assigned to the IDT and they can assist where necessary. But the chairman themselves in most cases, I think for the history of the IDT, there are only three chairmen that, had, um, that were attorneys of law. In terms of the chairman being a lawyer and it having an impact on their decisions, we're not seeing much impact. In terms of time, the law stipulates that awards should be handed down within 21 days, and on agreement of both parties, it can be extended to 42 days. That's about a month or a month and a half at the long end. Um, what we found was that the time it took between referral and award ranged from one month to as much as 84 months. And when I did the maths, 84 months works out to be like um, seven years. And yes, that was an outlier, but on average, it's taken 14 months, a year and a half. Um, and in many cases, the majority of cases, up to five months. And the difficulty with this is that the worker has been dismissed. They're without a job. They're deprived of their income. They might be entitled to get back their job and to recover their income, but they have to wait such a long time for justice to be served. And we know that justice delayed is justice denied, and so this is of great concern. In terms of grievance representation, we see where the two big unions, again, I keep on pressing the wrong button, the, the NWU, and the BITU dominate the activities, um, but there is this growing number of non-unionized workers that are active at IDT and carrying their disputes at, to the IDT and getting justice. In terms of the success rates of the unions, we see that BITU is a little bit low in terms of its success rate, while the UAWU, on the other hand, is much higher, but we need to note that the UAWU carries far less cases to the IDT than the other unions, the BITU and the NWU. Um, in terms of the logistic regression, which is the, where we can now establish, is there this causal relation? Um, we're finding that none of the factors outside of the case have any statistically significant impact on the IDT decisions. And so the initial findings of the research is that the factors outside of the case are not playing a part or are having an impact in the decision making, and it is in fact the factors of the case that are having the greatest impact. The challenge though is that we cannot measure this, and so we can only reach this conclusion by default, by not finding anything there, we can then say it's these things. But because of the level of documentation that's there, we can't properly measure this over the time period. In terms of the preliminary recommendations, I think the women were saying that they agree with this, you need to increase in female involvement, um, especially as chairman and deputy chairman and the reps. And in terms of the legalism, um, there is a case for more HR professionals representing grievance on both sides, um, on the side as being HR professionals working with employers and presenting the employer's case, as well as representing dismissed workers. Um, there are a number of former trade union officers that have been building up thriving practices. They're not lawyers. They're trade union officers, they're building up a practice representing non-unionized workers who have been dismissed.